Need for Speed Undercover is not a good racing game. It's a product of EA's John Ricitello era in which a new Need for Speed game was expected every single year, meaning that this particular title only had a development cycle of 16 and a half months start to finish. For even the least ambitious of titles, this kind of milestone would be difficult to meet to put things lightly, and yet Undercover was meant to be a racing game with a massive open world, working police chases, a full storyline driven by live-action cutscenes, and 62 fully customizable cars modeled for next-generation consoles like the 360 and PS3. The sacrifices made to get this game out the door in less than a year and a half were obvious to me from the moment I began playing, the most unfortunate being the complete ruination of its open world. While Undercover has a fully explorable open world, there's simply no need to ever make use of it. Events are marked on the map as soon as they're unlocked, but there's no need to ever drive to them, as they can simply be started from that same map screen or straight from free roam by simply pressing down on the D-pad. It's not like I wanted to drive in this open world anyways, because it just felt so damn empty. The Tri-City area and its connective highways were always so completely devoid of any signs of life that I didn't feel like I was driving through a city as much as I felt like I was driving through the corpse of one which I suppose is apt considering the state of Need for Speed at that time. The one thing that could have made Tri-City interesting was the story that was set inside it, but unfortunately, that sucks too. The logline for Need for Speed Undercover proudly touted on loading screens and in some of the game's original marketing materials is, get ready for this one, you're not good and you're not bad. Gee, Black Box, quite the unique setup you've got there. It isn't like the concept of an anti-hero has existed since the time of Homer or anything. While Undercover's thematic disposition is easily the largest of its narrative issues, it's hardly the last of them. The storyline is deeply confusing, the game ends on an anti-climax, and the acting and cutscenes just isn't good. Most actors either overact or don't act at all with Maggie Q giving the only performance that's sort of fine, but even that suffers from vague direction. Unfortunately, the game's problems do not end there, as it's obvious that it didn't receive the audiovisual polish that it probably deserved. The damage model is good even by today's standards, but everything else looks like smeared ass, to the point where I honestly wonder if the game legitimately released unfinished. Hop-in is far too obvious, with things like entire skyscrapers and mountains suddenly materializing into existence. Post-processing effects are embarrassing. Motion blur pulsates on the top and sides of the screen, smearing every object in the background. The bloom is bright enough to give me a sunburn, and for some reason, every paved surface is reflective. Then there's the sounds of the cars in this game, which sound good, but only when they work, which is approximately never. The car audio in Undercover is mixed erratically, often increasing and decreasing in volume and distortion seemingly at random, often so quickly that it sounds like someone's rattling an audio bus. I know why it's happening, it's because Undercover simulates sound bouncing off of different surfaces, but it just doesn't sound right at all. So with all those problems, that begs a question. Why did I bother to finish Need for Speed Undercover? And the truth is, while Need for Speed Undercover isn't really good, it's not necessarily as bad as you might think. First of all, for all its woes, at least the game is paced well and ends quickly. As soon as I started to get sick of it, about six hours in, the game was over. There's an almost constant stream of new content to choose from, and as far as I knew, I had free reign to choose which content I did and didn't want to engage with until I got to some linear narrative-based sections, of course. And also, the driving model is a complete blast. It feels old school, where cars have lots of grip at speed and lose speed as they lose traction. It feels fine at lower speeds in early game cars, but as the cars get faster and faster, the handling model gets more and more responsive, to the point where reaction time became a legitimate factor in whether I was going to make it around a turn or not. Not only that, but there's still some DNA for Most Wanted in Carbon. Police chases can still get as intense as they were in older black box games, and the soundtrack is actually pretty damn solid, featuring songs from Pendulum, The Chemists, Justice, Recoil, Amon, Tobin, and more. 
What all this leaves me with is the sense that Need for Speed Undercover was a game with real potential, that it could have been a great racing game had certain decisions not been made. The core of a very good Need for Speed game is right there, but unfortunately it has all these silly problems like the embarrassing lack of audiovisual polish, or the nonsense narrative, or the fact that the open world is legitimately useless, problems which simply degrade the experience because they're just so upfront. However, in conclusion, Need for Speed Undercover isn't necessarily bad. I actually kind of recommend it to certain people, specifically people who want a fun, frenetic racer that can be completed in an evening or two. Now, I'm not gonna lie, I think you should look at literally any other Need for Speed game that Black Box has made before you buy Undercover, if you're specifically looking for a Black Box Need for Speed game. But hey, you could do worse. And that's why I give Need for Speed Undercover a 5 out of 10. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please take a look at the rest of the content on this channel and consider subscribing. I make reviews and video essays, and I also stream on this channel every weekend, so be sure to click the notification bell if you want to be instantly notified when I go live or upload a new video. You can also follow me on Twitter or join my Discord server to get a look at what else I'm up to, and interact with me and others who watch the same content you do. And finally, I have a Patreon page available for those interested in directly supporting the channel. Tiers range from $1 to $10 a month, and all of them get you cool rewards, including early access to all of my videos. Again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.